Hey, Tim, before we get going on the uh, political stuff, Kim Cheadle, the director of Secret Service, stepped down today. Bipartisan disaster of a hearing yesterday. Uh, I mean, it was sort of like Raskin, Moskowitz, Jim Jordan, MTG, AOC, all the all the initials teamed up together. It was AOC, MTG, you name it. They all got together. Um, but here's my political question for you. Was this a missed opportunity for the White House, whether it was Biden or Harris, to call for her resignation before she stepped down? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know, to be honest. I think that the way that this was approached, which was a bipartisan way from Congress, is probably the right way to go. And that momentum was there almost immediately after the assassination attempt, right? And right, right. But what I'm getting yeah. at is, you know, this as a, as a political operative, mm -hmm. right? That you see, I mean, it's sort of, I always say it's like after a natural disaster, when a member of Congress writes a, a letter to FEMA, as if FEMA didn't know there was a storm, but they want to be able to say, I wrote a letter and then FEMA delivered, right? It's should they have said, you're going to resign. We want to we want to ask. For I, I, I do think, though, that in this circumstance, particularly like this polarized political environment that we are in. And it's why I think it's very wise that Speaker uh, Johnson and uh, uh, Leader Jeffries called for and have introduced a resolution to do a bipartisan task force to investigate. This is like part of the value here is to try to uh, get rid of or or crowd out the fringe conspiracy theories on this, right? Because there's no time for that. We need actual answers about the failures that happened. And so discussions about like this was an inside job or anything you've seen floating around. Um, I think it's wise that Congress took the lead on this, honestly. I, I am too. And I, I said our last guest was Susan Crabtree, who's been reporting on this. And I said, look, I've been doing the PR stuff for 30 years. I, I I, and I know a lot of these Secret Service guys, and but but like the lack of information and transparency over the last ten plus days has really led a lot of these conspiracies to take, you know, to get oxygen, and and unfortunately, I think rightly so. Meaning that if you're not telling me when the Secret Service director yesterday couldn't say, was it a did he act alone? And she says, I believe that was the case. That doesn't instill a ton of confidence. Yeah, I think the problem is there are a lot of questions and then there are a lot of really bad answers. And that doesn't always lead to forthrightness right. or transparency. I mean, like we talked about this when the we were getting a briefing at the RNC about the security perimeter being updated after the incident and the Secret Service went out. And we didn't get answers in that press conference. I think everyone was really stunned by that is that there was not transparency in that moment. And, Mind yeah, blowing. Yeah. Mind blowing. I mean, it was like I said, I've never seen this will go down as a case study in, in bad PR uh, because it's one thing. I mean, some you can get away a lot of times with saying this, like even yesterday, I think some of her answers, she could have just said, ma'am, that's a classified discussion that I'm willing to have with you. Uh, but I can't I mean, to say I don't like she looked clueless. And that was a that did not instill confidence. All right. I want to pivot to to the bigger news of the day and your expertise um, based on the delegate reaction in the last 24 hours. It's safe to say Kamala Harris is the nominee. She will not be challenged, correct? Correct. Yes. Not even, there will not even be token opposition. It is, it is done. Okay. Jamie uh, Harrison, the chair of the DNC was on the Today Show this morning. He said they're still planning on going forward with this virtual roll call, right? Uh, is that a good idea? I think it's I think it's fine. Honestly, I think the party is in a place where it's ready to rally. It's also still to, to be clear, as much as I say, like it's done, it's just because the writing is on the wall. It's not that the process has been closed or, you know, the opportunity has been taken away from anybody. It's just that, look, you know, she announced she raised one hundred million dollars from one point one million donors. Sixty two percent of them are new. The momentum is there. The delegates are there. Uh, the Democratic Party is is ready to get behind her. And that is there's just no denying that. Right. You could not invent. The Were you shot? I mean, I, I got to be honest, that number, that's a big number dollar wise. And it's a big number new donor wise. I, I was shocked by it. Were you? Yeah. I mean, and I think it, it, it is the best day in Act Blue's history. Right. And we're talking about wild events Which i mean is the 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 left platform yes, like right. we have uh, right yeah, and okay. and and for example like you know the the death of, of ruth bader ginsburg right before the election huge huge rallying moment and this is this is well beyond that so um it is in the fall of dobbs also or the fall of roe uh with dobbs also a huge moment uh but this this eclipses all of it and i think it shows the stakes it does show how energized the base is and is ready to to support kamala 
All right, let's go to mechanics for a second. There's a, a lot of reporting that they're trying to recruit David Pluff to come in to, as a senior, to some kind of senior role. How important is that for perception and also just an effective campaign? Yeah, I mean, one of the benefits, right, is that the vice president inherits the campaign infrastructure, you inherit the campaign leadership, you inherit the campaign coffers. I think maybe there is an, a question about whether or not there is a, a refresh of, of leadership. I don't think by any means that that's like a foregone conclusion. I don't know what the conversations with Pluff have been. I don't know if he's reaching out or they're reaching out to him. Um, but that's a decision that she does get to make, right? There is a change at the very top of the ticket. So there could be potentially people added to the mix and senior staff. I don't think you're going to see a huge shakeup. We saw her say yesterday, right? She asked for the campaign manager to stay on. She asked for Jenna Melly Dillon stand. Very smart. I, I, I think they are really savvy operators. They were operating in a very difficult environment previously. Uh, so it's good to, to keep the, the folks that we have there. I, I've been very critical. And as I, look, I am a staffer at heart, right? So I hate when staff gets blamed. Yeah. But I blame Biden's staff for putting him in the position that it was in in terms of the debate. We didn't have that debate. We wouldn't be here where we are right now. I, I, I would if you're Harris, do you question their loyalty and their decision making? No, I don't think so. I mean, like, I don't I also don't think it was set that walking into that ba that debate that we knew it would be a performance that would lead to the situation where we're in right now. I think there was, no, but you had was, to know there was, look, I, I, there was a possibility just I, quickly. I think there was a possibility that we got Joe Biden at the State of the Union. If it is a case where he has bad days and that was a bad day it was just bad enough that he is no longer at the top of the ticket so so i don't think right but you're rolling the dice right yeah. you knew well, i mean like they, they knew that that they were like hey he could have a great performance but there was a lot of i mean my point is you set him up you put him on a high wire and said hey if you cross the canyon yeah. it'll be really cool the downside is you could probably yeah. fall off but i think at that point remember where we were right and it's you know we have a reset now so we'll see see what the the vibes are going forward but um we wanted that debate because the campaign was starting to feel like a referendum on joe biden at that point you know how the economy was feeling it wasn't on donald trump he was kind of evading uh some media media criticism and there was no better way to to make it a choice election than to put them both on stage and to show contrasting visions. And, you know, you, you mean, to your point, it did not go as planned. All right, let's talk strategy here. There's a story in Political this morning that says Harris's emerging brain trust is also starting to rethink how the fundamentals of the race against Donald Trump have changed. They believe Harris's relatively strength is with young black and brown voters will put more states in play than a weekended a weakened Biden could have credibly contested. Quote, the Midwest is not where the opportunity is for her, one veteran Democratic operative close to Harris told Playbook. The opportunity with her is going to be in Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, and Pennsylvania. And however those four states go, the rest of the country will follow. So it sounds to me like they're abandoning Michigan, Wisconsin, the so-called blue wall, in favor of of that parking, which would we'll get to the VP part of this in a second, but is that is that an actually a viable strategy for them? Well, I don't think you can say I don't think they're abandoning the blue wall. I don't think any good good strategist would be abandoning the blue wall. I'm like indicative of the fact that Kamala Harris is in Milwaukee today, right? It's her first rally that she's going to be holding. But to that point, you know, there was polling that came out um, uh, that that Civics Analytics has been doing since the debate, and just looking at some of those demographics, for example. Young voters, 18 to 34, Biden was plus eight, Harris was plus 20. Uh, when it came to uh, black voters, Hispanic voters, Harris picked up seven percentage points. Uh, she picked up with, with black voters, eight percentage points with uh, Hispanic voters, almost all shifting them away uh, from third party candidates. So I think their theory of the cases is, is right there, is that each candidate at the top of the ticket gets to build their own coalition. She doesn't inherit the Biden coalition. She has a ton of goodwill and the Democratic base is going to come with her. But she also has advantages to press that I think are different uh, than President Biden could. And so, yeah, I think those those states in the Southwest, the Sun Belt, uh, may be more in play where previously it, it kind of looked like they were slipping away. All right. This morning on the two way with Mark Halperin, we talked VP stakes, right? I, 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 if I had to put money today, I'd say I give Josh Shapiro, the governor of Pennsylvania, the, the, the nod because more electoral votes are in Pennsylvania. I think he's got a better shot. I actually, the Republicans that I talked to prior to this week, like Josh Shapiro, they, I, and I, I think, for that reason, he could put Pennsylvania in play a lot more than, say, maybe a Mark Kelly would in Arizona. I know you brought up uh, potentially Tim Walz, the governor of Minnesota. 
where do, if you had to guess today, where does she go and why? Yeah, just to your point on Josh Shapiro, I mean, I think during the RNC or slightly before we saw David McCormick, who's the Senate candidate there, a Republican yes. shaking hands with Josh Shapiro, took a picture of it, tweeted it. I, so, I know <laughs> some appeal there. And, and I do agree. I think it is it is Shapiro, Kelly, maybe outside Cooper. And look, I'm from Minnesota. Um, so I, I love Governor Tim Waltz. All right. That's why today. I knew there it's, was a reason. I knew it. And it's like it's but he is. But he's look, he's he is from rural Minnesota, graduated from a high school class of 400. His congressional district, which he won multiple times, bordered by Steve King, Michelle Bachman. He's a veteran. He's a teacher. There's so much good bio there and he's a good communicator. So I'm by no means saying, you know, Tim Walls is going to get the nut. But I think he's in the conversation. We've also been seeing okay. reporting from MSNBC that they've requested his vetting materials. So he's in it. All right. I, I still think I'm going with Shapiro. Last thing I want to ask you is this. Benjamin Netanyahu is addressing a joint session of Congress tomorrow. Obviously, big issue, the, the, the split within the Democratic Party in particular in terms of support for uh, the Palestinians. How big of a deal is it optically that Vice President Harris will not provide, per, preside in her role as president of the Senate tomorrow when he addresses a joint session of Congress. Yeah. I mean, I do think there's been reporting that she had, she did have a meeting with him. I think also, and we talked about this in, in two way this morning, I think um, part of the edge gets taken off on that attack because now we're also hearing that JD Vance is not going to be attacked. Yeah, but he's not the president of the Senate. He, he doesn't he, preside. He's not the president of the Senate. I don't, I don't think it is a, I don't think it is a, um, a, a snub, like purposeful snub. I mean, he's going to meet also we're hearing with president Biden, but later in the week, because the president's still recovering from COVID. Um, so I, you know, I don't, I don't think it is a barb to be launched at the VP. Okay. Well, I, I'll, I'll launch it. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe and click the notification bell to get more.